welcome and please be seated. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to these 2017 graduation exercises. I'd like to quickly recognize some special groups and guests. First, a welcome to the nice weather. Thank you for showing up. Parents, grandparents, Families, friends, thank you for the deep love that makes it possible for us all to gather here at all. It's every bit as beautiful as the weather. Alums, trustees, thank you for your love for Lawrence Academy. Staff, thank you for the loving way you make this place beautiful, safe, nutritious, and warm every day. Faculty, thank you for your wisdom and care and for making these students your mission. A special thanks today and recognition to a distinguished group of retiring faculty, John Kaiser, Michael Veet, Ned Mitchell, and David Smith. Class of 2017. It's my favorite graduation trick. All you have to say is class of 2017. We bring a specially strong feeling to you today as we honor the work you have done and the lives you will lead from here. This is the 224th time this special occasion has taken place on this hillside. For all the changes of time, there is one constant to this commencement plot. We will begin and proceed in an orderly fashion, but we will almost certainly dissolve at the end into a warm and salty bath of feelings. It's natural. A graduation is like reaching a scenic viewpoint at high elevation, just at the end of a long drive. You pull over for a moment and check out the view. It's big. It's beautiful, it's powerful, but the journey is almost over and you feel it. Our carefully chosen steps will be overwhelmed by our beating hearts. It'll all come together in a little bit later in the moment when we sing these lines from the school song, Inside Cover. From thy portals facing westward, westward, westward. Where the last faint sunbeams glow. Catch we on the mountain summit. That's the scenic viewpoint. Visions, dreams that still will go. And we'll return to this line at the very end. So away we go. Here's some visions, some dreams to remember for seniors, this emotional summit. Some moments, that feeling of getting back together at the beginning of the year seeing old friends back in the same place where you became new friends. That whole cycle beginning in the beautiful days of fall and ending with these finally, finally beautiful days. The literal high point of mountain day, not the queasy Bucky bus ride on the way up or the after lunch, but the group picture with the area horizon as the backdrop. Those tired but energized moments after a long period of hard good work just before a well-deserved break, going from your LA home to your home home. That winterum feeling, yeah, the feeling right before it where you're excited to get in it, and the feeling right at the end when you're excited to go on break, but actually that point when you really sink into it, when you're really with it. That feeling of walking off the stage or the floor or the field, or today the quad for the last time, this morning's sunrise. It can be hard to make sense of it all. Here's one way of understanding it that's worth stating today. Emotion can be shaped into a creative force for a better world. In fact, it must be. Here's just one example from the last few weeks from the world of the arts 
beginning with one acts, then individual musical performances, visual arts, ensembles, dance, last night's performances, all these ways of giving and receiving feeling in exchange between performers and audience. In those moments, it's not about what we make, it's about who we are. Well over half the school during those weeks produced some form of art, and the whole school received that art, emotional, beautiful, meaningful. And now we are performing the art of graduation, practicing and performing at the same time, full of feeling. In his essay, What is Art?, the Russian writer Leo Tolstoy says, art is the product resulting when one person consciously communicates to others by means of certain signs, some feelings which he has experienced. Yes, it's a pretty broad definition of art, suggesting that we are all artists, working in the medium of human emotion, communicating constantly our shared experience, creating quality of relationship every day. And on this beautiful graduation morning, we ask, what and who will you create today? The best art, according to Tolstoy, communicates feelings that are on the highest level, feelings of brotherhood and unity. We feel the force of that unity in those classes that really click, those teams that come together, those moments of expression that are not performance, they're just 100% experience. We feel it in the senior slideshow, which displayed the art of lives coming together, and we feel it now. If we are more than a collection of individuals, we perform the greater good. It is not always easy or comfortable, but it's real. Interdependent, we are a brotherhood, a sisterhood. That is who you are, and that is who you can be, class of 2017. Woo! <laughs> I'm gonna close this piece with a passage from the great 20th century writer James Baldwin. Baldwin closes his short story, Sonny's Blues, by depicting a work of art in this highest, best sense, a blues song in which Sonny, who has struggled deeply in his life, finds new life through his piano. In this passage, we see just how far feeling can go. Sonny's fingers filled the air with life, his life, but that life contained so many others. It was very beautiful. Freedom lurked around us, and I understood at last that he could help us to be free if we could listen, that he would never be free until we did. Freedom probably sounds about right right now to these graduates, but we won't settle for individual freedom. Your lives contain so many others, and our world needs free at last freedom. Let freedom ring freedom, greater good freedom, justice freedom, and our freedom depends not just on the ability to perform, but the ability to listen. A thousand or so people are here today to witness the passage of these 100 graduates, these 100 lives. We are eager to listen for what you create with your lives and the visions and dreams that will fire the soul. Thank you all for listening this graduation morning. It's my pleasure to introduce C.J. Carter, who will introduce today's graduation speaker. Hello, all. Hello. Welcome, family, friends, faculty, students that are required to be here in the back. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to Lawrence Academy and the class of 2017 graduation. Whoop, there we go. Yeah. 
Like Mr. Scheibe said, my name is CJ. I'm a four-year day student from Air, Massachusetts, and it is my job today to introduce our guest speaker. I'm sorry, wait, hang on, that was wrong. We don't have a guest speaker. Mr. Smith, David Smith, is anything but a guest here at Lawrence Academy. If anything, we are all his students on this elm tree shaded hillside, a hillside he would like to call his dojo. <laughs> Mr. Smith has been in LA for so long that his bio on the website simply says 40 plus years because I don't think it can count that high. <laughs> but with my Lawrence Academy math skills, and when I say math skills, I know the whole math department behind me is rolling their eyes. I can count, looking at you, Ms. Ryan. <laughs> I can count that David Smith has been working at LA for 48 years. Those years include being an English teacher, drama teacher, wrestling coach, mountain biking coach, admissions officer, pretty much everything. I could go on forever. Those 48 years do not include his time as a student as he is the member of cl the class 1965, giving him a grand total of 52 years at Lawrence Academy. I think I was right there. They can, they can check me later. <laughs> His time at LA shows two things. One, he, el he loves LA a lot for sticking around this long. And two, he's older than he lets people think. <laughs> and I can joke about this because, or so I've been told, I'm just the younger form of Mr. Smith. <laughs> I can remember leaving English class and having friends come up to me and say, hey, you're turning like him. You're going to be him. <laughs> Slowly but surely, day by day. <laughs> I always took that as a joke, but when, I came, when it came time to write this, it got scary. Like, I saw <laughs> so many similarities. First, we both went to Lawrence Academy. First similarity. <laughs> We, we both play the banjo, if we want to call what I do playing the banjo. It's not really. Uh, Mr. Smith has been known to dazzle English classes with his magic and his just deep knowledge of English. And I, as well, have been known to dazzle English classes with magic tricks. And that's, that's it. <laughs> we both love nature and spending time outside. We both love history and just knowing really random facts, which is probably why we're both bad at math. Just no room up there for anything. We both love writing. He has his own play, Flurry of Birds, and an adaptation of Little Women. I have my attempts at poetry and spoken word and short stories. All of those and his writings will be on sale in the gift shop as you make your way out this afternoon. <laughs> the only difference that I can really think of between us is that Mr. Smith can speak Gaelic, I don't crush my students' souls, <laughs> especially with vocab quizzes, and I also don't call my favorite, I don't, get, I don't let my favorite students call me Smitty. It truly is an honor to be introducing Smitty today, <laughs> not only because we're good buddies, but because of the last thing that we share in common, and that is that our time at LA is coming to a close. And I know how hard it is to be leaving here after four years, and it's such a wonderful place, but I can only imagine how hard it must be to be leaving after 52. Well, I can tell you that LA will be different without us. <laughs> Lawrence Academy will be missing a beloved and dedicated English teacher who can turn any book, poem, short story, into more than just words on a page. And I struggled to find the words to define our relationship, so instead, I will thank him for the time we've had and the time I spent basically just being his apprentice, his little mini-me, <laughs> even though I'm taller than him. <laughs> and as well for teaching me the values and character that I hold today. I want to thank him for just being my mentor with magic, English, and just being an overall good human being. And as well, I'm just the apprentice here. So I think it's only fair that we turn it over to the real magician so he can dazzle you all today. I'll stop talking, I promise. Um, 
So you can DAS this all today and address the class of 2017 with his 52 years of magical wisdom. Please welcome to the podium, Mr. David Smith. Wow, thank you, CJ. That was amazing. And, uh, you set me up better than you know. Good morning. And good morning, especially to the class of 2017. I told myself I wasn't going to break up, but I can feel it starting already, so hang on. Um, and good morning to the family and friends who have come here to celebrate your graduation. Now, before I start, you 10 folks on the aisle seats, underneath your chairs, you'll find a small bag full of envelopes. Don't spill the envelopes. Take one for yourself and pass it down the line. Pass the bag down the line or whatever. Yeah, fine. We're going to have some fun with those in a little while. Just hang on to them for now. Today, you join me and thousands of others as Lawrence Academy alumni. And because I am retiring this year, you and I are also ending our formalized relationship to the school. For these reasons, I want to speak to you in a way that is personal and reflects the relationships we share as LA alums, as teacher and student, and as lifelong members of the LA family. And to do this, I've divided my remarks into three chapters. Chapter one is entitled Footprints. Chapter two is entitled Just One More Story. And chapter three, Grad Spell. <laughs> chapter one, Footprints. In the spring of 1963, when I stepped out of my mom's car to go to my admissions interview, I couldn't have known that I was making the first footprint on the campus that would be central to my life for the next half century. That's a small step for a 16-year-old, a giant leap for David Smith. <laughs> if all of my footprints since that day could suddenly show up in bright colors, I don't know how much bare space there would be left on this campus. I've been all over the main campus, the athletic fields, the surrounding woodlands. I've been in every basement, room, attic, and even a couple of the cupolas in that time. I've even left footprints on the sides of buildings, teaching students to rappel off the old library terrace or off the roof of the science wing. Of course, when I graduated, when my number of footprints totaled just a few million, L.A. was a very different school, all boys, jacket and tie, sit-down meals. There were only 233 students. The entire faculty and staff totaled just 27. I was one of 42 day students. They called us day hops or day boys. And our graduation ceremony was held in the gym right over here. I think my seat would have been right about where the Black Box Theater is now. But I'm not here to reminisce. Like you, I graduated on a fine spring day, and four years later, I came back to teach. Why? <laughs> if ever a young person says, I want to grow up and work at a boarding school, tell them, don't be silly, you can't do both. Life in a community of young people like you graduates is invigorating, stimulating, creative. Although the rules imply that we adults are in charge, the truth is it's your energy, your curiosity, your passions that set the pace day by day. You keep us on our toes, you keep us honest, you punish us mercilessly if we forget our sense of humor. 
And so we adults never really grow up, but the secret is we never really wanted to. And as you find out, the student-teacher relationships here are very special. My teachers wanted me to be curious, thoughtful, and active. And they reflected those qualities in their own lives. Those men were curious and thoughtful and active. And I'm sure I speak for the 10 alums here on the faculty, the staff, and those who volunteer in the daily activities of the school when I say I came back to continue those student-teacher relationships, to give you our energy and to receive your energy back in turn. To steal a slogan from the State of Maine Office of Tourism, Lawrence Academy is worth a visit, worth a lifetime. <laughs> Chapter two. One more story. As an English teacher, my job has been to share stories. And I want to do that one more time. I first heard this story 35 years ago. It has stayed with me, and I hope it stays with you. Once upon a time, a man had to make a long journey through the desert. So he started off before dawn, full of energy. But as the sun climbed in the sky, a hot wind moved across the desert floor, and the, began, the man began to feel tired. And he heard a voice come out of the hot wind. And the voice said, pick up stones and carry them in your pocket. And you will be happy and you will be sad. And the man said, oh my, God, my imagination's playing tricks on me. Why would anybody pick up stones and carry extra weight on a journey like this? And he hurried on. At midday, the sun had climbed high into the sky. And the man was feeling exhausted. His, feet, his footsteps began to uh, tremble, and he wandered off the path sometimes into the cactus on either side of the trail. And he heard a voice come out of the cactus, and the voice said, pick up stones, carry them in your pocket, and you will be happy, and you will be sad. And the man said, oh, surely I'm losing my mind, because no one in his right mind would add extra weight on a journey like this, and he pushed himself forward. But by midday, the day was at its hottest, and he began to stumble. His feet began to drag, and sometimes his hands and his knees became cut as he fell on the hard earth. And one time when he was down, he heard a voice come out of the hard-baked clay, and the voice said, pick up stones, carry them in your pocket, and you will be happy, and you will be sad. And he said, all right anything to stop these voices and he scratched at the ground and he got a few rough stones and he shoved them in his pocket and he carried on and he felt he thought he could feel the weight of those stones in his pocket but at least he heard no more voices and at sunset he came to his destination a pretty village with a running fountain and he refreshed himself with delicious food and drink and in the evening he sat on a bench under a shade tree, and he thought back over his journey, and he remembered the stones, and he reached in his pocket, and he pulled them out, and he was happy, and he was sad. He was happy because those rough stones had turned into diamonds. He was sad because he realized he could have carried just a few more. <laughs> My students will recognize this as a parable, and this is the lesson I think the parable teaches. The challenges we take on, the good work we do faithfully, the responsibility to which we are loyal, these things seem like burdens sometimes, but these are the things that give value and meaning over time. Ask your parents. They are midway through their journey. Their pockets are full of stones, and they're hoping for the best. Ask your grandparents. They'll tell you the parable is absolutely true. As I say, this is my last story for you. It has stayed with me. I hope it stays with you. <coughs> Chapter 3. 
watching the news, I realized that my graduation on June 5 in 1965 and your graduation today have much more in common than a half century of changes would suggest. When I was a junior, I saw on a bulletin board over here in this large room a hand-scribbled note. The note said, the president has been assassinated. When I scoffed at somebody's bad idea of humor, Bob Bates, a classmate who was standing next to me, said, no, Smitty, it's true. Our generation, the baby boomers, have forever been identified by those turbulent years loosely known as the 60s, the social and political upheaval of the time. Today, you graduate in turbulent times as well. Next fall, you're going to walk onto college campuses churning with debate and activism, and you will be pressed to calibrate your intellectual and moral compasses. But I'm not going to give you a sober lecture on the troubles of the world. No. As CJ has told you, one of my hobbies is magic. So now I'm going to cast a good luck spell to protect you as you graduate into a troubled world. And that's why chapter three is called Grad Spell. <laughs> Time to tear open those envelopes and take out the four playing cards inside. Okay? Turn them away from you, face away from you. And try not to look at the faces until um, the end, all right? Now, the first part of this is tricky. Um, and as you know from Harry Potter, uh, uh, magic spells are very particular. So follow directions, listen up, don't fall behind, or you might turn into a frog and spend the rest of your days living in the cow pond. Okay? Uh, the, the cards are very slippery, so hold on tight. And the first thing you're going to do, put them in a group like this and fold them over in half. Hang on tight, they're slippery. Make a nice deep crease in them. Nice firm crease in them. Good. Okay? Now fold them back the other way and make that crease even deeper. Yeah. Yeah. To be lucky, this is a good luck spell, to be lucky you have to be flexible. So bend this back and forth and back and forth and really weaken that center strip. Okay. And now, to be lucky you have to occasionally do the unthinkable. I want you to tear these cards right in half. And now you have four cards in each hand, correct? Okay, now take one packet, put it on top of the other, and hold them all together. Okay, now we're going to count off some cards. Take the top one, two, three cards together and move them to the bottom. Take the next one, two, three cards together. Make sure you have three. And put them in the middle of the pack, not the bottom. Okay, don't fall behind. Here we go. <laughs> we all set? Three on the bottom, the next three in the middle. Okay, the next card then is number seven. Ooh, seven's a very magical, lucky number. Save this. Um, put it under your butt and say, sit on it for safekeeping where you can get it later. Okay, hey, we just, we just saved some good luck. Let's get rid of all your bad luck. Ask yourself, are you someone who has a little bit of bad luck, an average amount of bad luck, or just way too much bad luck? Uh, yeah. <laughs> if you answered a little bit, take just one card off the top. If you said, eh, an average amount, take two cards off the top. If you said, whoa, a whole lot, take three cards off to the t up top, all right? 
Hold those in your hand up in the air. One, two, or three cards, it's your choice. That's bad luck. Throw it away. <laughs> right. Okay. Now, now we want to ensure that you have good luck all the time. So we're going to count off the days of the week. Card number one off the top, that's Sunday. Move it to the bottom. Card number two, Monday. Move it to the bottom. Card number three, Tuesday. Move it to the bottom. This is Wednesday. Move it to the bottom. Thursday. Move it to the bottom. Friday. Move it to the bottom. And finally, Saturday. Okay, last step. We're going to reduce the pile of cards in your hand down to one card. And this is how we're going to do it. Remember the old game, she loves me, she loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not. We're going to do it with cards, okay? Now, some of you, whether you threw away one, two, or three cards, will finish before others. If you finish and get down to one card, just wait for the rest of us to catch up, okay? First card, luck loves me. Put it on the bottom. Luck loves me not. Ooh, throw it away. <laughs> Luck loves me. Put it on the bottom. Luck loves me not. Throw it away. <laughs> Luck loves me. Put it on the bottom. Luck loves me not. Ooh, throw it away. <laughs> Luck loves me. Put it on the bottom. Luck loves me not. Throw that away. Luck loves me, put it on the bottom. Luck loves me not, throw that away. Now, reach under your butt, pull out the card you saved, don't look at it yet, and put them together. And if they match, the spell is firm. Good luck to the class of 2017. As you go forward, remember the stones in the desert. Pick up challenges. Do your good work faithfully. Fulfill your responsibilities. And lastly, come back often and leave more footprints on this campus. It's your school worth a visit. It has been worth a lifetime. Thank you, Mr. Smith, for setting an impossibly high standard for every future graduation speaker. We'll now move to the awarding of graduation prizes. As I do that, I want to draw attention also in the program to those prizes that have already been awarded on cum laude day. Also worth noting, those students who have earned membership in the Cum Laude Society designated by an asterisk um, in the graduation list. Assisting me is as Assistant Head of School, Libby Margraf. The Margaret Price White Award, given by Robert F. White, Class of 40, in honor and memory of his wife, Margaret Price White. The award is presented to a member of the sophomore class whose motivation, work ethic, and attitude toward all areas of school life have quietly and unassumingly earned the respect of the faculty. Jenny Dick. <laughs> oh. 
Over here, Jenny. The Thomas B. Warner Memorial Prize, established in September 1979 by the Warner family and friends in memory of Thomas B. Warner, Lawrence Academy alum and class of 1975, to be awarded annually to that incoming senior, so a junior, who has demonstrated a remarkable determination to achieve to his or her fullest potential in the classroom, on the field, and in the extracurricular activities of the school. Paul Tola. Carl A. P. Lawrence Award, established by Mrs. Lucy W. Lawrence in memory of her husband Carl, alum of the class of 1910, trustee from 1954 until his death in 1972, and lifelong benefactor of Lawrence Academy. Awarded annually to that member of the junior class whose achievements in all areas of school life demonstrate competence, loyalty, and concern for others, qualities that earn Mr. Lawrence the respect of all who know him. Isaac Mukala. The Harvard Book Prize, awarded to that member of the junior class who combines excellence in scholarship and high character with achievement in other fields. This prize was established by Richard Aldrich, class of 25, in memory of his great-great-grandmother, who was in the opening class of 1794, and his mother, Mary Pickering Joy Aldrich, who was in the class of 1886. Jory Van Nest. The David Soren Yutter Memorial Award, awarded to a junior whose interest and in activities demonstrate an appreciation of natural beauty and a love for Lawrence Academy. A.J. Mastrangelo. The James E. Baker Prize, awarded by an alum of the school, class of 1871, to a student in the junior class for the best all-around development in attitude and scholarship, Mackenzie Gondek. The Mary Elizabeth Chickering Prize, established by Mrs. Chickering's husband, George Chickering, class of 1930, and awarded to that day student whose academic accomplishments, wholesome school attitude, and general maturity deserve special recognition. There are two prizes this year, 
Ethan Karp, and Annie Barron. Howard W. Glazer Class of 55 Award, established by the Glazer family in honor of Howard's 30th reunion to be awarded to a student attending Lawrence for at least two years, whose enthusiasm and dedication to hard work have generated the most school spirit, Will Murphy. The Melvin W. Mann Award, awarded to the Lawrence Senior whose character and leadership ability have contributed most to fostering mutual respect between members of the school community, Kayla Fatzinger. <laughs> the Proctor Award, Established by Gary Edlin, class of 1963, in memory of his father, Harvey, honors that student proctor who best demonstrates qualities of integrity, initiative, and responsibility, Vanessa Xiao. The Richmond Baker Prize. A prize donated in honor of Richmond Baker and awarded by vote of the varsity coaches to the female athlete of the senior class who through her dedication and determination on the athletic field best demonstrates the qualities of a true leader. Two prizes, Laura Lundblad and Tate Jordan. Raymond A. Ilg Jr. Award, established by Mrs. Ilg and Ray's friends and classmates at Lawrence, 1939, for that senior who has shown outstanding qualities of sportsmanship, leadership, and achievement in athletics, A.J. Dillon. The Norman and Catherine Grant Award, established to honor 40 years of dedicated service to Lawrence Academy by the true extraordinary people for whom it is named. The Grant Award is made annually to a graduating senior who has done the most on the playing field and in his or her association with teammates to further the spirit and ideals of athletics and good sportsmanship at the Academy. Laura Zavril. The Whitehurst Prize, given in memory of Reverend Raymond W. Whitehurst and funded in part by the class of 1984 to that member of the senior class who has evidenced exceptional growth toward maturity of conduct, opinion, and discourse, Aaron Williams. The David Thomas Kinsley Prize for Public Speaking, established by his daughter, Catherine Mary Kinsley, to be awarded to the senior who displays the most outstanding skills in class discussions and formal classroom presentations, Ben Flom. <laughs> The Tom Park Class of 29 Memorial Award, established by the Barron family in June 1989 in memory of Tom Park, Class of 1929, an outstanding citizen in the town of Groton and active supporter of Lawrence. 
awarded to that student athlete in the graduating class who has best demonstrated loyalty and dedication in his or her athletic pursuits and academic endeavors. Two awards, two mats. Matt Hayes, Matt Glassman. The Adrian Chen Class of 92 Award, awarded to a senior at graduation whose native language is not English and who has achieved linguistic and cultural fluency while enriching the Lawrence Academy community by sharing his or her language and culture with others. Subin Kim. The Pillsbury Prize for Character and Conduct, established by the Honorable Albert E. Pillsbury, open to any member of the graduating class. Sam Swanson. <laughs> Pillsbury Prize for General Improvement in Scholarship and School Duties During the Course, established by Honorable Albert E. Pillsbury, open to any member of the graduating class, Aaron Antosh. The Treisman Prize for Superior Scholastic Achievement Established by an alumnus, Robert S. Treisman, class of 1953. Award to that senior who has attended the school for at least two years and has become the academic leader of the school as demonstrated by his or her ability to think independently, creatively, and deeply by his or her enthusiastic engagement in learning and by the superior quality of his or her scholarship. Nate Diedrich. The Ferguson Prize for Leadership, awarded to that member of the senior class who has exhibited superior leadership abilities in the classroom, on the athletic fields, and in the community activities of the school. Presented by alumnus of the class of 1971 in honor of 40 years of dedicated service to Lawrence Academy by Mr. and Mrs. Arthur Ferguson. Abigail Cody. The Benjamin Davis Williams Prize, established by the class of 1984 to honor Benjamin Davis Williams, headmaster of Lawrence Academy from 1969 to 1984, and awarded by vote of the faculty to that senior whose leadership qualities, innovative ideas, and varied interests in the numerous areas of Lawrence Academy life all make this a better place to live, to experience, and to learn. Sam Rosenstein. The Faculty Award, awarded by the faculty to that member of the school whose conduct and character have contributed much to making the academy the type of school to which a parent would wish to send a son or daughter. Taylor Goodman Young. Now we'll move to two graduation speakers from the class of 2017. It's a tradition of the school that uh, two members of the class, of a young man and a young woman, are elected by their classmates to speak for them. Our first speaker today will be from Concord, Massachusetts, Annie Barron. <laughs> so first off I just want to give a huge huge welcome and thank you to everyone for being here so thank you alumni board members family members 
faculty, students, and who could forget the class of 2017? <laughs> we made it, y'all. <laughs> okay, so I'm up here to give a speech, and I see a lot of people out here in the audience, but I'm really up here right now to talk to students and not just our graduating class. There's a quote from a book called Brave in the Rocks by Sabrina Ward Harrison that I borrowed from Miss Moore a couple months ago, and I've had it stuck in my mind ever since. Ward Harrison decided to drop everything and travel to Italy because she felt like her life was going in the wrong direction. In Italy, she writes, I have been touched by lives I did not know existed, people living their lives beside mine, if only for a minute. Sabrina's words could not be more resonant with me after what I've been able to be a part of at LA. I dropped everything I knew as familiar in order to come here, as I know so many of you have. And I'm not only incredibly thankful for the opportunities I've been given at this school, but I'm also grateful beyond words for teachers that show for old friends, for new friends, and lives I did not know existed. Growing up, I was always afraid to talk in class. <laughs> and I was afraid to share my writing up until my junior year here at Lawrence, when I finally began to ask myself uh, and find myself as a writer and a poet. I never really asked myself why I was silent until the beginning of this year, and the answer I discovered was that I was terrified of the power of my own voice. Voice has definition and it has volume. You can use it however you like, which can be very freeing and rewarding, but it can also be very risky and hurtful in some situations. I understand the moment I stepped on campus as a freshman that what you say at LA is what you are. And since I was afraid of saying the wrong thing, I was afraid to speak up and define myself. My voice has been influenced by this community that I chose to surround myself with, and I cannot be more grateful for it. A little over a year ago, I was accepted into a writing workshop that was over the summer, which is actually at the college that I'm going to be attending in the fall in Oregon. And I wouldn't have come across it if it weren't for my teachers encouraging me to explore writing in the first place. I actually remember a conversation that I had with Miss Smith <laughs> during my freshman year when I told her that I hated poetry because it was so indirect and there was no reason for it. <laughs> Now I laugh at the thought because I'm about to be dropping everything that's familiar to me. This school, my friends, riding horses, which is something that I've done my entire life, um, and I'll be leaving my town and my home. All I'm going to have left that's familiar to me is myself and my outlet for my voice, which is writing. But now that I'm leaving and I'm going to school on the other side of the country, I'm going to have to start all over. And I have to ask myself one more question, which is, who am I when I'm not at Lawrence Academy? I never would have found the courage to move across the country if it hadn't been for me allowing myself the space and the time to figure out what it meant to be a person and to have a voice in the community. There's a quote that I first found during my sophomore year by a singer named Dan Reynolds. <laughs> he said, never chase others for validation. With time, they will all go, but you will always remain. Growing up here at LA year after year, I've learned that self-validation and happiness do not come from trying to please others. They come from being kind in my words and my actions. And there is nothing that makes me more proud to be myself than being kind to everyone around me despite our differences. In November, I sent an email to my classmates and later to faculty about being aware of the diversity and opinion on campus after the election. I was beginning to notice that people were fearful and judgmental when speaking up for what they believed in. In part of my email, I wrote, all I care about is that you all make people in this community feel safe, accepted, and able to express themselves in a positive way without feeling like they will be morally attacked. This doesn't mean we have to stop talking. What this means is we all have to start listening. The most important lesson I've learned here at Lawrence is that diversity is not understood and nor is it embraced until every voice is given the space to find its own volume and create its own definition. Lawrence makes room for diversity and difference. There's no doubt about that. But what's important is that voices are heard. 
because having a voice only matters when it is a part of a conversation. And while that's scary at times, I think it's mostly exciting to be touched by lives we'd never before known existed side by side for these four years. Throughout high school, especially now since I'm leaving this place I've been so comfortable in, I'm so, so, so grateful to have been part of, to been able to grow up surrounded by all of you people. We all have such a powerful influence on each other, whether we realize it or not, and the people we've chosen to surround ourselves with will have a direct impact on how we see ourselves and how we will go about discovering and following through on what we're passionate about. Whether it is math, soccer, theater, writing, or community service, each of us are able to find people here who support us, who are kind to us, and who will listen to what we have to say. I am so happy that I chose LA because I finally feel like I was chosen back. I know so many people also wanted to come up here and give a speech today, and I'm gonna be honest, at first I didn't want to, <laughs> uh, but here I am. And throughout my struggle with finding my voice, here I am, surrounded by all of the people who watched it happen. And I am so, so proud of myself. <laughs> whatever grade you're in at LA, or whatever college you're going to next year, I hope each and every one of you can allow yourself the time to find someone that you can wake up to every day and be proud of. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> And our second speaker this morning from Bedford, New Hampshire, Matt Glassman. Where's my family? Okay, I just want to say that. Hello, everyone. Most of you know who I am. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Matt Glassman. People at the school may know me as the boot boy because I wore a boot the first year I came to the school. Some people may know me as the kid on the basketball team who doesn't look like he really plays basketball. <laughs> Others may know me as the kid with the 50 pound backpack who never leaves the library. I've even been called the mystery man by some people in the school. Mystery, hmm, <laughs> that's a great word, mystery something that is difficult or impossible to understand or explain. Yep, that seems like me. <laughs> the difficulty in understanding mysterious people is that you can never tell who they really are. I've had problems showing people my real personality throughout high school, especially after switching schools freshman year. Well, four years of high school have gone by, and now I'm faced with my last chance to be myself and let you all into the mind of Matthew Glassman. <laughs> by the end of the speech, I'm going to try and accomplish three things. Number one, I'm going to suggest living in the moment and valuing each and every day. Number two, I'm going to share my high school experience and explain why I do certain things in my life. And lastly, number three, I'm going to provide everyone in this crowd with suggestions for how they should go about with their lives. <laughs> <laughs> Throughout my existence, I've come to realize the best way to live life is to live in the moment. I've noticed in my time that people either dwell on their past life or are looking forward into the future way too often. I don't think that it is necessarily wrong to do either of these things, but I think that the people would be better off living in the present. For instance, I've met people that go through high school with the sole interest of getting into college. Now don't get me wrong, this is a great goal to have, except when this goal makes a person forget about living in the present. There's more to life than going to school and getting an education. For those students still in high school, don't become the college process, but rather be a part of that whole operation while maintaining a life outside of the classroom. I can assure everyone here today that you will be better off living in the present as opposed to looking into the future unaware of all the days that pass by never to be seen again. In my current life, I try to appreciate every single day that is given to me. I recognize the significance of this goal during my junior year sports journalism winter. I believe it was the third or fourth day of my winter um, 
when I was driving to school in the morning. I was stuck behind a car going the speed limit, and of course to me this felt like two miles an hour. Suddenly my eyes began to close, and I started to doze off. <laughs> Boom! Before I knew it, I opened my eyes to my car smashing against a tree and being flung up into the air, landing perpendicular to the road. I was extremely fortunate that day to have left that car crash unharmed. This day in my life has resonated with me because I very easily could have hurt myself and somebody else. In my life, I've worried about a lot of things that in reality are pretty insignificant. It took me nearly dying to realize that life is truly a gift and we should all appreciate every moment. You never know when your time is going to be up. There's a point in there that I could bring out by addressing a couple questions that have been asked to me many times throughout my life. People tend to notice that I smile a lot and they commonly ask the question, why are you always smiling? So why do I smile? Do I smile because I'm an attractive kid who was voted best smile in the school? <laughs> Obviously, yes. Okay, I'm just kidding. I don't just smile because I look good. <laughs> Honestly, I smile because I'm just happy to be here. I smile because I know that I've put myself in a position to become the person I want to become, and I'm just happy to be alive and be in the place that I am today. Another question that I've been asked is, why do you say hi to random people that you don't even know, or even just kids that you pass by in the hallway? I try to say hi to as many people as I can because I don't understand how two people can walk by each other and not acknowledge the existence of the other person. It's messed up. <laughs> I've seen this happen everywhere, including here at Lord's Academy. I've walked by so many people who either look down as I walk by them to avoid eye contact or just look at something else to avoid communicating with me. I try to at least acknowledge the people that I encounter in my life because even though I might not know anyone, uh-oh, oh, oh okay, sorry, because, <laughs> because even though I might not know them, it could make that person's day. I remember sophomore year when I didn't really know anyone I just wanted, to, just wanted somebody to come talk to me. I've been that kid that has walked into the dining hall and didn't have a table to sit at. I guess I say hi to people because I know what it's like to be alone and don't want anyone to feel like they're alone on a planet populated with 7.5 billion people on it. In conclusion, I have three suggestions for everyone here today. I could try to frame these suggestions around a story that captures all three lessons but the reality is the most important stories I can tell are about the many times I've tried to accomplish something and I've struck out. Despite striking out, <laughs> I believe these setbacks are important. Like the time when the girl that I really liked at the school lost my phone number. <laughs> Although, I'm still waiting for something good to come out of that day. <laughs> but I've been waiting for a really long time. <laughs> in all seriousness, it's because of, all, of failed attempts that I believe these three ideals hold true. The first suggestion is to reach out of your comfort zone. My second suggestion is to be yourself. And finally, my third suggestion is to always interact kindly with others. Third suggestion. I want to thank everyone for allowing me to share my story. And if you don't remember anything else from my story, remember this. In the words of Russell Westbrook, don't do they, do you. And now for the presentation of diplomas. I'll be assisted by the president of the Lawrence Academy Board of Trustees, Bruce McNeil, and by associate head of school, Rob Moore. One note as we present the diplomas, for those students 
who have parents or parent figures who are part of the faculty, staff, or trustees, that parent or parent figure may hand out the diploma and there are four such moments today. Abdulrahman Mohammed Alamran. Aaron Joan Antosh. <laughs> Anne Maury Barron. Dinara Burkitbaeva Burik. <laughs> Victoria Ingrid Brandbold. Brent Edward Briggs. <laughs> Timothy Andrew Burke. Catherine Grace Burns. <laughs> Jacob Peter Bisco. Harry Fitzwilliam Carley. Yeah. <laughs> Charles William Joseph Carter. Siliana Elizabeth Carvalho. Andrew Brudnick Sorrell. Choi Chung Kwang Gordon. <laughs> Jonathan Spencer Combs. Charles Nelson Corey the Fourth. <laughs> 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 
Abigail Rose Cody. James Arthur Curley. John Allen Curtis. Sharon Marquise Daly Harris. <laughs> Alex David Dervartanian. Nathaniel Adams Diedrich. <laughs> Algiers Jamal William Dillon Jr. Ainsley Elizabeth DiPietro. <laughs> Catherine Lynn Driscoll. Tim Fan Hao Yuen. <laughs> Kayla Marie Fatzinger. Rachel Lee Fiato. <laughs> Benjamin Lewis Flom. Matthew Philip Glassman. <laughs> Sarah May Goldman. Taylor Elaine Goodman Leong. <laughs> Mitchell Morgan Groves.
Chloe Ann Hartner. Matthew Brendan Hayes. V. Ang Chloe Huang. Vanessa Yao Xiao. <laughs> Alexander Ali Jaffrey. Timothy Robert Jones. <laughs> Tate Veronica Jordan. Ethan Terry Carp. <laughs> Grace Marie Killian. Kim Subin. <laughs> Yun Kyun Ko. Emily Christina Lancy. <laughs> Quinn Reynolds Lawton. Sophia Noel Lewis. Edward Everett Locke. Louisa Cranston Long. Aaron Joseph Lorden. Kaylin Mizuno Lum.
Laura Noel Lundblad. Austin Milan Magera. Nikita Makarenko. Daniel Felix Marino. August Von Martini. Zachary Thomas May. Adeline Rose McCullough. Mackenzie Elizabeth Melvin. <laughs> Nicholas Lorenzo Messina. Gregory Thomas Mitchell. <laughs> Patarapan Moonken. Benjamin David Munich. <laughs> William Christian Murphy. Craig James Needham. Yes! Joshua Peter Hal Newsom. Tom Ian Tammy Nguyen. <laughs> Nguyen Nok Yum. Zachary Tadmore Odell. <laughs> Stephen David Olive.
Nicholas Jean-Louis Oliver. Austin James Pine. Elizabeth Curtin Quinn. Haley Norma Quinn. Edwin Calvin Ray. Peter Sanders Reichheld. Sonia Valerie Ritchie. Ashley Page Rivet. Samuel Brady Rosenstein. <laughs> Kelsey Aaron Ryan. Alicia Clara Seekman. Glenn Miller Smith the third. Peter David Soika. <laughs> Abigail Caroline Streeter. Deshaton Suwanakiri. Samuel Robert Swanson. James Russell Swiggett. <laughs> Federico Adrian Terrazas.
Rachel Carlin Thero. Anna Christina Tickum. Rachel Eleanor Walsh. Aaron Markel Williams. Sean Marlowe Williams. Guan Chen Shannon Wu. Frank Wu Ifan. Kara J. Parnes. Angel Chia Xinyan. Thomas Mullen Zaleski. Laura Marie Zavril. <laughs> Owen James Zadunsky. These closing remarks have a few instructions with them. The way that we recess is that the class will form a bit of a line around the perimeter of the quad, and then the faculty will walk through them and process in a handshake line. I have one more quotation for you as you go. It's from David Foster Wallace from another commencement exercise, and it's about freedom. There are all different kinds of freedom, and the kind that is most precious you will not hear much talked about. The really important kind of freedom involves attention and awareness and discipline and effort and being able to truly care about each other and to sacrifice for people over and over every day. That is real freedom. We'll sing the school song, Please Rise.
Thank <laughs> you. 